Gee, it's a, it's a thrill to, to be in Florence and, and talking about my work. Um, thank you, Ellen um, Toscana and NYU Florence for participating and partnering on this great day symposium where I've already learned so much. And um, thank you, Elizabeth Sackler, for making me have the opportunity to have a really good job <laughs> and a very important place um, that I'm very proud to have worked at for the past eight and a half years. And um, my presentation today, as, as Mary mentioned, will be um, an overview of some of my exhibitions that I've worked on in the past eight and a half years at the center. The goal of which is really to um, present, talk about, illustrate the methodological frameworks that I have, um, we have been focused on and the ways that we've been thinking about framing feminism as an expansive, um, framework for understanding exhibitions beyond um, just women's work. <laughs> um, I have, some of you will know that I said this on Friday when I talked in a, we talked in a class um, with the students here. Um, I always preface my conversation by saying there's two things that I think make the Sackler Center extra important and particularly useful and viable and um, have very strong long-term repercussions for me. The first is that it's the Sackler Center for Feminist Art and not the Sackler Center for Women's Art. I think that's a distinction that plays into very important conversations that we need to have. And in order to do that, we have to obviously have an expansive conversation about what feminism is um, beyond um, gender conformity. Um, the other thing I say that I love about the Sackler Center is, it, is that it is at the Brooklyn Museum, um, a historical institution founded on models in the 19th century in which there was an epistemological framework that believed that it was possible to collect the world effectively. Um, and the um, institutional structure that that represents is very much influenced or impacted, I should say, by the presence of the Sackler Center in that institution. It is my opinion that the presence of the Sackler Center in the Brooklyn Museum as a discrete site makes everything else in the museum look different. It's impossible to come to the Brooklyn Museum, visit the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center, look at Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party, look at the exhibitions we're working on, and not walk out and see everything else in that museum differently, whether that's from our ancient Egyptian collection to our American decorative arts collections to our European collections. And that's a very important part of the way that I have um, conceived of the exhibitions I've worked on over the years. So, what I like to say is I think my job is not to um, anoint <laughs> who's feminist and who's not, um, but my job is to show that if you are um, alive <laughs> in 2017 and you're looking at visual culture, you have been impacted by feminism. Feminism has influenced the way you look at almost anything. And what does that mean? And how can we explore that most broadly? And so the exhibitions I'm gonna to present today or just a couple of examples that sort of maybe point to the way in which this methodology has, we have tried very hard to make this methodology expand beyond perhaps the expected. Um, I'll start with an image of the dinner party, which you all got a great introduction to earlier this morning. This dinner party is the center of the center. It is the work of art that inspired so much of the thinking that still goes into the center. Um, and it is the framework that really develops art historically, what I consider one of the most important contributions of feminist art history, the idea of revisionism. Revisionist history is exemplified in the dinner party. Revisionist history as it was built, structured, thought about by people like Judy Chicago and as Elizabeth mentioned, Linda Nochlin and others in the 1960s and 70s was an attempt, as Judy has said, very specifically to rewrite the history she was taught. And so in this case we have the monumental manifestation of 1,038 names that Judy and her collaborators worked back into history, literally and figuratively, with um, their presence in the center. And they inspire a, um, an acknowledgement of biography. They, they inspire an acknowledgement of personal stories. They inspire um, that feminist adage, the personal is political, as a legitimate form of art making. One of the two things that the dinner party has done for us is, as I said, reintroduce the idea of personal narrative as valuable in the, in the era of late formalism. Um, and also the idea of women's 
arts, decorative arts, lesser arts as also important within the context of the museum setting, whether that's in this case China, paint plating, paint, I can never say that, paint, plate painting, thank you, and, um, and the craft material that the runners are, are composed of. Um, so the center has been in the Brooklyn Museum for 10 years. As Elizabeth described, it houses a dinner party, it houses multiple exhibition um, galleries, and it, hosts, and it houses the forum where we have multiple um, programs all year round. But one of the things that we've been wanting to do for the last few years in the center, playing on this idea of making everything else in, in the institution look different, is also permeate, if you will, the rest of the museum. And so as an example of one of the projects that we did that literally went outside the museum and took a reflective model literally to the facade of the museum was a piece um, done by um, Suzanne Lacey in 2013 called From the Door to the Street. And this project, which was um, a social practice project that was a collaboration with Creative Time and the Sackler Center, um, Suzanne worked with local communities um, on, on a block in Brooklyn, a block of bronze stones, where she invited local community activists, feminists, um, to come and talk about feminism in the context of the community. Sort of, she called it between the door and the street because she imagined, I don't know if there's an equivalency here, but she imagined a stoop on the front of a building as a space that's both private and public. A space where you are in public and can be heard, but you also have an assumption about your neighbors, about knowledge, about a commonality. And so Suzanne invited all of us to sit on stoops and talk, and the public could come and listen. And so this is an example of the, some of the questions that she asked, and they were installed on the steps at the front of the, muse of the museum. I just wanted to mention a couple of the Herstory Gallery projects we did. They are inspired by the women on the dinner party. This was the first Herstory Gallery show that I did. It's an image from an exhibition called Healing the Wounds of War, the Brooklyn Sanitary Fair of 1864. Rather than focusing on exhibitions that were straight biographies of the women included in the dinner party, I really tried to find stories within the women's stories to illustrate something expansive. So in the case of, um, of Oh my gosh. Elizabeth Blackwell. <laughs> I was trying to think of the name. Elizabeth Blackwell was the first woman to graduate from medical school in the United States. She was born in Great Britain. She um, knew and was inspired by Florence Nightingale. And when she came to the United States, she started what was effectively the first public health movement in the United States, by which troops in the Civil War were um, properly cared for, he, field hospitals were set up. So we made an exhibition about a woman who effectively started the public health movement in the United States during the Civil War period and coincidentally had a strong impact in Brooklyn. So an opportunity to talk about a national project, a local project, and international ramifications um, pointing to the biography of one of the women in the dinner party but really focusing on the impact that she had. Another important um, exhibition that we had in the, Hearst, in the Herstory Gallery was an exhibition um, called Twice Militant, Lorraine Hansberry's Letters to the Ladder. Lorraine Hansberry appears on the heritage panel, the heritage floor of the dinner party, on which there are 999 names. Lorraine Hansberry was a prize-winning author and um, um, playwright. She wrote um, Raisin in the Sun. Sorry, you guys. Thank you. And um, when I started doing research on Lorraine Hansberry, I also discovered um, in plain sight, a la Wikipedia, um, that Lorraine Hansberry had contributed letters to the first lesbian publication um, in the United States called The Ladder, a publication that was um, illegal in the period in which it was printed. It was illegal to mail um, what was called obscene material at the time under what were then called the Comstock laws. And Lorraine Hansberry contributed to this very important early lesbian publication, um, which is a little known part of her history. Um, but when we started to research at the Schomburg Center, we discovered incredible writings, letters, notes to herself that we um, presented in an exhibition, which we called Twice Militant because Lorraine Hansberry, in a 1959 interview with Studs Terkel, uh, said that in any oppressed group, the women are twice oppressed. And anybody who's twice oppressed has a tendency to become twice militant. 
So we thought that was a perfect example of a title for an exhibition about a woman who, in this case, you could, I guess, claim was three times oppressed. So a couple of the major exhibitions I worked on, I'm just going to run through these quickly, but these are larger exhibitions. So um, I'll start with this exhibition. It's called Materializing Six Years, Lucy R. Lepard and the Emergence of Conceptual Art. This exhibition is based on a book that was hugely inspirational to me when I was a graduate student. It was also hugely inspirational to my very good friend, um, Vincent Bonin, who is my co-curator. And should we read the title of the book? <laughs> the title of the book is Six Years, The Dematerialization of the Art Object from 1966 to 1972, a cross-reference book of information on some aesthetic boundaries consisting of a bibliography into which are inserted a fragmented text, artworks, documents, interviews, and symposia, arranged chronologically and focused on so-called conceptual or information or idea art with mentions of such vaguely designated areas as minimal anti-form systems, earth or process art, occurring now in the Americas, Europe, England, Australia, and Asia with occasional political overtones. The longest book title in the world. I think it's 76 words. And this was a really inspirational project for me because Elizabeth mentioned Lucy Lepard, um, and it's interesting in terms of what we were talking about earlier with um, Carla Lonsi, uh, there are very many parallels to um, a female critic in the 1960s and 70s trying to position themselves differently at the same time that they are trying to understand, codify, explain the art that they are seeing produced within their own communities without the structures and the language with which to do that. And hence this title is kind of a grab bag that I think is very honest of Lucy to sort of say simultaneously, this is complicated, this is fascinating, there's a lot going on here and I'm not quite sure what it is and I'm still trying to get my arms around it. And the way that she got her arms around it, which is different than Lonzi, was she made a book that is basically an annotated bibliography. She took all the cards that she was receiving from all the exhibitions that she was seeing, all the press releases, and she made a chronology of every interesting work of art exhibition happening that she saw in her community between 1966 and 1972 and she turned it into a book. So it's not in her voice. It's, in the, it's a critic writing basically in the voice of artists. It is also, she claims, the best show she ever curated. So as a curator, when you see a critic call a book the best show they ever curated, you're challenged, right? It's an interesting problematic to think about what she meant by that. And so, like Lonzi, soon after this period of 1972, Lucy goes off to commit the better part of the next decade to her life exclusively to writing about women, to defining feminist art, to um, encapsulating that community which she finds herself moving into in this period. So as a curator at the Sackler Center, one might assume that if I was going to do an exhibition about Lucy Lepard, it would be about her feminist work. I, instead, I thought it was very important to do a project about Lucy's contribution to the definition of conceptual art. Uh, which is one of the most important, in my opinion, art movements of the 20th century. And she, single-handedly with this book, offered a framework that still exists. And so I thought it was very important to start with that. So as a result, um, we made an exhibition. There's some images here, some slides. And we, you know, once you have the idea for an exhibition and you have somebody like Lucy Lepard leading the way, you just basically have to follow her lead. So we installed the exhibition, the way the book is installed, the way the book is written, year by year, finding examples within each year to present to the public. Some very well-known artists who would never be considered feminist um, from, we have Bruce Nauman here on this screen with a very early um, video of his from 1966 called Fishing for Asian Carp. We have um, Lawrence Wiener, we have Hans Hacke, we have any number of other male artists who are not um, feminist, have not participated in a feminist conversation, but in my estimation, they are part of this conversation because Lucy is framing our understanding of their work. And that's a point worth making <laughs> over and over and over again. Um, I'll just show a couple more slides. So the other thing that Lucy said, in addition to six years being the 
best show she ever curated, she called this exhibition, which was her first exhibition, called Eccentric Abstractions, she called this the best piece of criticism she ever wrote. And as you can see from some of the artists involved, Louise Bourgeois, Eva Hess, Bruce Nauman, Keith Saunier, it was very prescient and, in fact, probably the best criticism she ever wrote. Um, but so the exhibition focuses on Lepard as curator, Lepard as critic, Lepard as voice, but also within the context of all of these other voices. Another example. One of the things that Lucy said about this period that made her turn towards feminism was that she felt like it, conceptual art wasn't political. She didn't see the politics in the conceptual art in the way that she wanted to see it. And so her work with the Art Workers Coalition and her activism in the anti-Vietnam War movement encouraged her to move into a more active, what she saw as a more active politics. What's fascinating to me and probably to many of us in this room is we look back on this work now and all we see is politics. But at the time it didn't feel activist and engaged the way that she felt like she needed to be. So one of the things she did was she curated a show with um, some colleagues um, called Benefit for the Student Mobilization Committee to End the War in Vietnam. This was at Paula Cooper Gallery. It was one of the first exhibitions where people came together artists donated work and money was raised for a political movement. This is a very political act and it's one that we see now enacted across the board. I don't know how many artists in the room are continually asked to donate work for events, to raise money for something. This is the beginning of that and Lucy called this the best minimal art show she ever curated. Because it was. We have these amazing pieces by Joe Baer, um, and others, and it was a purely minimalist show. So there was no political content, but it was absolutely a political action. Um, then, I think this might be the end of the six years, um, then we have uh, just another example of new forms of exhibition making that were very interesting to Lucy. And this is in 1969 section of the exhibition, and I'm talking specifically about this sort of calendar that you see here at the front, calendar of postcards. Um, a work by Ann Kawara. This is another example of an exhibition called Mail Art, another important democratic attempt to bypass the gallery commercial system in order to um, have a direct conversation. And Ann Kawara is an artist who did this incredibly elegant, elegantly and um, personally and poignantly with a project he called I Got Up, in which every morning when he got up, he would post on a, he would stamp a postcard and send it to selected people so that he would have a direct conversation through the mail, an exhibition of sorts of his life with people that he chose to have that conversation with. What's wonderful about it is that by stamping the same thing every morning, changing the time, he's really not engaging that directly with you, but it becomes a very personal interaction, right? So what do we know? We know that, we know that Ang got, got up late on this particular day, right? But that's all you know. But then we set up the postcards that Lucy received in one month, I think it was November 1969, into the form of the calendar for that month. And so for instance, in this case, you can see there's a day missing. So what happens when you know, you're in this process, you're used to getting the postcards from on, you're not thinking about it necessarily, what happens if one day the postcard doesn't arrive? Then your question becomes, well, what happened to on? Is he okay? Did he just not get up? You know. So it's this very interesting framing of an exhibition that becomes highly personal and highly poetic. And Lucy was very engaged with supporting artists that she saw trying to bypass the gallery, the market, the system that so many con conceptual artists wanted to think about changing. Um, it is ironic that in this day and age, conceptual art is often considered kind of the most um, unavailable in a populist sense, but the intention of the work certainly in its infancy was very much about um, a democratic impulse. The last slide I'll show you from this exhibition is um, an installation of uh, the exhibition Circa 7500. It is, it is the one project that does not appear in the exhibition six years, um, but it is the last part of a series of exhibitions that Lucy did that were called the numbers shows. Um, and the numbers were based on the population of the city where the exhibition appeared. So the population of Valencia, California at the time that Lucy did her show was about 7,500 people. Theoretically, the number of people who might be the audience for the exhibition. Um, it is the last of, it is the fourth and final of the number of shows she did. The others were in Seattle, in Vancouver, and in Sao Paulo. Um, 
It's the only one devoted to women because throughout her work with conceptual art, she kept hearing that there were no women conceptual artists. When from that very first slide, where I showed the eccentric abstraction exhibition, obviously there were always women present. And so Lucy leaves this period in her career, moves directly into feminism with this exhibition, which really joins the two kind of chapters of her life. And because we like to always talk about our institutional history, even if it's difficult, this is, I'd like to, this is a great image of Lucy at, um, at the Brooklyn Museum in 1971 at a hearing um, that was called, What Can Museums Do for Women? And the answer at the time was nothing. Um, the exhibit, the um, conversations had things to do like with childcare, you know, can we have childcare in a museum so a mother can go and look at art um, during the day and things like that. Um, and of course, most of those things are still being discussed today. The next exhibition that I want to discuss is a very different proposition in terms of thinking differently methodologically about feminism because it is an artist, Judith Scott, who made purely abstract sculptural objects. She made purely abstract sculptural objects from found materials at a place in the Bay Area in Oakland, California called Creative Growth. It was a space made for artists to make art. She worked there only for about, forgetting how long now, maybe about a decade. Um, the objects tell nothing about biography. The objects present themselves as purely formalist exercises in a craft material, which are mesmerizing and sort of fascinating. Um, this is an example of a work that um, actually came into the Brooklyn Museum collection after the show, which we're thrilled about. This is a piece that Judith made from paper toweling that she found around creative growth when she was there alone and couldn't find any materials. So she just found what she needed and, um, and made this object, inside of which are personal objects that Judith would collect. So from x-rays, we know that inside of this sculpture there is um, one of those um, metal heaters from a stove top. Um, so she would find objects, she would often steal objects from people, and she would make these sculptures, and she would work on them for months at a time, and, um, and uh, the body of work has become incredibly um, well-known in the art world. She was just featured in the most recent Venice Biennale, and the kicker, of course, is that these are objects that, while they don't tell about biography, Judith Scott is an artist whose story is completely driven by her, bibli by her biography. She is an artist who was born with Down syndrome. She was deaf and largely mute. She was institutionalized for 35 years before she was taken to creative growth by her, paternal, by her sister, her twin sister, where she had the opportunity to become an artist. Um, this is an important story for the Sackler Center to tell. It's an important story about an artist who never uttered the word feminism in her lifetime, but whose practice and whose um, work is possible because of the various civil rights movements of the 1960s and 70s, the feminist movement, the civil rights movement, the gay rights movement, the disability rights movement, which directly took its modeling from the feminist movement, in order to find a place where an artist could make work with disabilities. Um, I would also argue that um, we are able to see something like this as art because of the work of Judy Chicago and other feminist artists who led us to understand that fiber and non-traditional materials are legitimate for art making. So this was a very important exhibition for us. I co-curated this with Matthew Higgs, the director of White Columns in New York, um, because it sets up a different model. It sets up a different way of talking about the impact of feminism culturally, broadly, socially, politically, um, and in a very resonant way. This is a picture of um, Judith working um, in um, Oakland at Creative Growth. Apparently, she would work for weeks or months on a sculpture, um, and obsessively, and, but not perseverably, because she knew when she was finished, which is, if you're an artist, is often the sign that you're an artist, right, when you know something's done. Um, and when she was finished, she had, a symbol, she had a system, so she would let the people who worked with her know that it was finished, and they would take it away. She would then immediately start working on the next object. So she never thought about the objects having a life after they left. Apparently when she would see them installed in the galleries at Creative Growth, she might wave or pat them, but they weren't constructed as objects for us. They were constructed as objects for Judith. And 
So as a result, there's no up, there's no down, there's no right orientation or wrong orientation, there's no interview with Judith where she talks about her influences, where she describes why she makes what she makes, there is no information but the objects themselves. And so for us, it was a very important conversation to talk about what that means for how you present an artist where there's no information. So one of the things that we did was we installed the work on a platform about the scale, about the height of the tables at Creative Growth, and we didn't install any on the walls. Her work has been installed on the walls. If any of you were in Venice, you may have seen they were hung on fishing wire. We decided that we were only going to, we were going to sort of step out of that conversation and not make curatorial decisions that weren't invited by the artist. The other very important part of this conversation is, and it's a very feminist conversation, is the issue of biography. How do you talk about an artist with disabilities um, when she never talked about her disability? What is the driver in the conversation about outsider art? And how does a feminist perspective allow us to talk differently about uh, works of art that are not driven by the biography in terms of the information they're given us, even if the artist's story does become sort of paramount. This is a wonderful portrait of Judith by the great photographer Ann Collier, made just before she died. So this 10th anniversary project we've been having, do I have like two more hours? Um, is called The Year of Yes, Reimagining Feminism at the Brooklyn Museum. And the goal of this, as we talked about, is the idea of looking forward, is the idea of the Sackler Center has had an amazing 10 years. What will the future look like? What do we want to do in a conversation about the politics and cultural constructions of feminism as they exist now and as younger generations of artists and others are telling us they want it to continue? So in the process of doing that, when we were talking about what kinds of what we would do for the year of yes, the first thing we knew we wanted to do was we knew we wanted to take over the whole museum. That was easy, we knew that. What we weren't so sure about was how those projects would all fit together, how they would sort of um, push on ideas that uh, might be taken for granted. So the idea that is certainly prevalent in our field, if Judy Chicago, Linda Nochlin, Lucy Lepard instigated this, histor this period of historical revisionism, now 40, 50 years later, we are in the process, we are in the period where we're, even re where we're revising that revisionism. In other words, we have to look at our own history. We have to decenter all of the stories that we've constructed for the past 40 years to get even deeper into this subject. And we have to be brave and honest about how things function in the worlds that we live in. So we came up with 10, we came up with about a series of exhibitions and innumerable programs. I'm only focusing on the exhibitions to describe some of these issues. So I'll just quickly tell you about a couple of them. Um, the first was an exhibition that opened last year, um, just before the election, um, by Marilyn Minter called Pretty Dirty. Marilyn Minter is an artist who came of age in the 60s and 70s, absolutely has always identified herself as a feminist artist, um, but was often taken to task by other feminist artists for the content and for the approach of her work and its um, embrace of straight male pornography um, and other things as well. So Marilyn is an example of an artist whose career covers decades. She is hugely influential, particularly to younger generations of artists, but who has often found herself in a contested position to uh, what she would call feminist orthodoxies. Uh, one of my favorite projects was undertaken by my colleague Ed Bleiberg. It's called A Woman's Afterlife, Gender Transformation in Ancient Egypt. Uh, so this is an example of us really moving out into the entire institution. This is an exhibition that takes on and presents new historical research within Egyptology, driven by a couple of young women who decided that the common wisdom in the field that a shift in gender pronouns on ancient sarcophagi was not just a mistake. So gender pronouns change on ancient Egyptian sarcophagi, and, the, and there was never a lot of research into why that might be. It was just, an, it was just assumed it was a typo or, and, or something. Um, I'm obviously ad-libbing this because I am not an Egyptologist, but um, so this, these young women thought maybe there's a reason for this, and let's try and explore what that is. And the current thinking is that 
Because in ancient Egypt mythology, men gave life and women carried life, in order for a woman to be born into the afterlife, she had to temporarily become male. So the shift in gender pronouns and the shift in other signs of gender, the color of the skin um, on different sarcophagi, um, on the same, in the same tomb, is now theorized to have been a res as a result of this cha momentary change that a woman would have to make so she could literally give birth to herself into the afterlife. So the fact that this is recent scholarship that is very much influenced by feminism and by a shift in thinking that is, um, allows for a completely different reading and also s remarkably um, uh, resonates with conversations happening today is, is pretty extraordinary. Um, then we have um, George O'Keefe, Living Modern, a very, highly pop a very highly, a highly popular exhibition that just closed in March, um, taking one of the icons of feminist art, the final place setting on Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party, and reimagining, revisioning Georgia O'Keeffe's persona through the lens of her own self-fashioning, meaning her clothing. One of the first things I said when this exhibition was presented to me by Terry Carbone, our then American art curator, was, oh great, so the Feminist Center is going to do a show about Georgia O'Keeffe's clothes. That doesn't sound really feminist. When in fact, it turns into a examination of um, cultural product that reinforces and also expands our understanding of Georgia O'Keeffe. George O'Keefe is an artist who, per one of the earlier questions today, never wanted to be called a woman artist. She had no interest in the feminist movement, and she was around to see it. Uh, but she, nonetheless, remains an icon of a feminist approach to life that many people continue to emulate and admire. And so she is part of that conversation. And in this exhibition, we explore the ways in which she drove the way the world saw her from her earliest moments. This was not um, an examination of Stieglitz and his representations of O'Keeffe, but it was very much about O'Keeffe's own sense of how she wanted the world to see her in terms of her clothing, in terms of the way she lived, in terms of how she lived from the time she was in high school. The reason I felt okay about doing an exhibition, this exhibition, aside from the fact that Wanda Korn, the scholar who did it, is incredible, was that Georgia O'Keeffe left her clothing to her museum in Santa Fe. So the fact that the artist left her clothing, decades worth of clothing that she kept for decades, um, to her museum indicates that she thought about it a particular way. And so therefore, it made it seem valuable to have a conversation about what it meant to her. Um, so that feels like a different method of approach, a different sort of cultural history. The last exhibition I'll talk about is We Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women, 1965 to 1985, an exhibition that just closed. Um, it opens next week in LA. If anybody's going to be in LA, it's going to be open there on the 13th. This is an exhibition that really gets to the heart of this project for the Year of Yes. It really gets to the heart of this idea of how did feminism emerge in the 1960s and 70s, and how did it emerge in multiple ways in various communities beyond the most commonly understood community of middle class educated white feminism, particularly in the United States, something that's often called white stream feminism. Um, as you'll notice, we don't use the word feminism in the title. Um, my co-curator, Rejeko Hockley, and I had a conversation, had a convening with a number of the artists in the exhibition, and we learned several things about the way this exhibition should be structured. The first thing was that um, the artists wanted to tell the story themselves. So the way that we did that, there were several ways we did it, one of which was is the publication we made for the exhibition, which is a source book of material from the period, many, most of which has not been published for a very long time. So we compiled a source book, Writings of the Times. We thought about how to lay out the exhibition instead of in thematics, chronolo chronologically, but based on important historical moments. And I'll walk you through the exhibition with that. Um, but to go back to the black radical women, Feminism is a contested term 
in um, many communities of color in the United States, amongst black women in particular. And so we wanted to address that or acknowledge it or talk about it. Um, and so one of the things that the women artists who were in our convening said that they did not want the word feminism in, in the title. So we used the word revolutionary because as has been alluded to or said here today already, these artists did not want to change the system. They wanted a revolution. And that was the message that we got very clearly. So some of the artists, we'll just walk through really quickly. This is, again, installation shots of the show. Um, this, this, the, this first gallery of the exhibition showed two very important works which are about, in a way, about absence. I'll talk primarily about um, the painting on the wall, Faith Ringgold's for the Women's House, um, which is a painting that Faith Ringgold, a very important artist from the 60s and 70s and onward for decades, one of the powerhouses of our exhibition and of the world, and who is making work as we speak. Um, this is a, a painting that she made in 1971 for the incarcerated women at Rikers Island in New York City. She received what was called a CAPS grant, public money, to make a public work of art. And her decision was, instead of making a painting for a library or some other public venue, was to make art for the people who needed it most. And in her opinion, that was the women who were incarcerated on Rikers Island. She went to Rikers Island and met with them and had a conversation about the content. And the content, um, as you perhaps can see, is divided up into, into sort of narrative slices of different sort of aspirational models, sort of the post-incarceration ideas for many of these women, whether it's the first woman president, basketball player, doctor, um, it's an interracial family. It's a inclusive painting aspiring to the future. Interestingly, Faith calls it one of her most radical paintings for the reason she made it, while the content she also acknowledges is relatively, probably less radical. This painting um, was installed in Rikers Island and lived there for about a decade, at which point Rikers Island became a male-only facility, and the painting was whitewashed over, the irony of that, and um, was about to be destroyed when one of the guards who worked at Rikers Island remembered Faith and contacted her, and they had the painting reversed. They had the painting restored, and it still belongs to the correctional facility of the state of New York. Um, this is the second time it's been out of prison <laughs> in its um, history, so we're very proud to have it for this exhibition and to have it sort of announce this, this very important exhibition. Then we moved into the early part of the exhibition dealing with um, the spiral movement and the black arts movement. This is the transitional period between the civil rights movement of the early 1960s into the black arts movement of the later 60s and 1970s. Um, the images that you see here, a glorious self-portrait of Faith Ringgold on the far wall. Um, and um, we have a lot of ephemera in this exhibition as do most of my exhibitions. And then we have two wonderful paintings by a young woman at the time named Emma Amos. The Spiral Group was a group of artists who came together in 1963 to organize a bus to go to the March on Washington. Um, they did one exhibition together. They had conversations about the validity of abstraction versus representation and the politics of those two forms within the black community. Do we make art for our community that sends a message that is political, or do we engage in the formal conversations of the era in the art world? Emma Amos was the only woman invited to join the spiral group. She says that she was invited because she was 20 and not threatening the way that somebody like Faith might have been. Um, Emma, this is um, a self-portrait, the sort of tondo shape within the square canvas on the left. And then as you can see, that painting is again repainted into a portrait of a, friend, a, portrait of a couple of friends of hers a couple years later. For Emma, um, she says and has said that for her as a black woman, simply walking into a studio is a revolutionary act. We then moved into the black arts movement. This is more spiral on the left, documentation of the group. Then we opened the exhibition also with this incredible Elizabeth Catlett sculpture, carved wood sculpture called Homage to My Young Black Sisters. Elizabeth Catlett was one of the oldest artists in this exhibition. She was at this point, um, had decades of teaching under her belt. She was an enormous influence. She was living in Mexico. She was an ex expat. She saw the young women of her community in the United States participating in the revolutionary movements of civil rights, and she makes this beautiful 
work in homage to those young women. So we loved having this opportunity to open the exhibition with um, her work. In the background, you see um, works by Jay Jarrell, a member of the Black Arts Movement. These are two suits that she made. The one on the left is called the Urban Wall Suit. Um, Jay talks about a wall in her community. This makes me think both of Suzanne Lacey and of Donald Trump. Um, she talked about a wall in her Chicago neighborhood as a public, private site for her community where people communicated with each other. Where you could write on a wall, I love so and so. Or you could put a poster on a wall, come to a protest. It was a site where the community kept in touch with each other. And so for her, she made this urban wall suit as an homage to this kind of community, locus of her community. It also has references to quilt making, which is very important in the African American community. It is a suit that she wore. We have pictures of her wearing it a lot, um, often with her child on one of her hips. In fact, when we went to restore it for our exhibition, the conservators showed us where the, it's all worn down on one side, which is probably her preferred hip for her child. On the back wall, we have a series of prints um, printmaking is very important in this movement. Um, it is accessible, it is affordable, it is easily disseminated, it is democratic, and it um, is a very core part of the black arts movement and a core part of our collection. I should also mention that the Brooklyn Museum is lucky to have acquired several years ago a very important black arts movement collection and a lot of the work in our exhibition comes from that, including Jay's, um, Jay's two pieces here. The colors that you see are what are called um, Kool-Aid co Kool colors in the Afri-Cobra movement. This desire to have popping, loud, bright colors. Um, in the 1960s, if you were part of the art world, that would have been shocking. Some of that may be happening in pop, but even in that context, it's sort of understood in an ironic way. And this is a very different conversation. Then we move into Black Feminism, a gallery that starts with one of the very important collectives of this period called Where We At. Uh, the two paintings on the back wall are by an artist named Dinga McCannon, amazing artist who um, founded Where We At with Faith Ringgold and others. Um, the painting on the left is called Revolutionary Sister. Dinga calls it her Statue of Liberty, or she, excuse me, she calls it our Statue of Liberty. Um, it is a strong woman in African colors outlined with hardware that she said she picked up in a hardware store. She said for her it was a revolutionary act as a woman in this period to walk into a hardware store. <laughs> um, the head on the um, painting is actually hinged. Um, our conservators were very interested in talking to Dinga when she came to the museum for the opening about why the painting was hinged. And the painting was hinged because Dinga was 20 and she didn't have a car, and if she needed to move the painting, she needed to fold it to get onto the subway. So I love these sort of personal narratives that add sort of layers of information to a story when I can imagine a conservator or an art historian spending lots of hours thinking about why this might be the case, and it's usually because it needed to get on the subway. <laughs> um, and then we have another amazing Elizabeth Catlett piece called Target. Um, a bust of an African-American man in the scope of a rifle, an incredibly prescient and incredibly difficult and incredibly moving work of art that, in my opinion, exemplifies Catlett's strong base of knowledge in the history of sculpture, and particularly modern sculpture, taking a bronze monumental head of a man, the way in which we monumentalize, heroicize people, is that word? and um, in this case turns it completely around uh, as an indictment of, of the American community at the time, which obviously also resonates entirely today. Next to that we have this glorious piece by Betty Saar called Homage to Aunt Jemima Cocktail. It is a Maltov cocktail made out of a Gallo wine jug by um, Betty Saar. It is an incredible object with um, a bandana as the lighting mechanism for the Molotov cocktail. It has on the front of it um, the profile of Aunt Jemima, which is a pop culture reference that Betty Saar appropriated very effectively over the years as a critique of the place of African Americans in um, pop culture. On the, black is, on the back is a black power fist. Um, what I love about this piece is the humor in it. For those of us who are old enough to remember, I remember the moment when my parents began drinking Gallo wine in the United States. There was this moment in the 70s where suddenly wine became a thing and you had it at dinner, which I know is unusual here. But in the US, this was like a cultural shift and it happened when the Gallo 
wineries opened in California and started mass producing wine and shipping it all over the country. So I love Betty Saar taking this aspirational bourgeois middle class symbol and turning it into a Molotov cocktail. <coughs> Some of the ephemera we have in the exhibition is really important and I'll just mention two of them and I'm sure I'm supposed to be done now. Um, the first is uh, an article that was published in the New York Times Magazine by Alice Walker called What the Black Woman Wants from the White Liberation Movement. I'm getting that wrong. Um, very important piece written in 1974, a scathing indictment of white feminism, still painful to read, very strategically placed by Alice Walker in the New York Times Magazine, the paper of record for most people who would have seen themselves as part of the solution. Um, very important piece of writing. Juxtaposed with that, we have Revolutionary Hope, and monumental conversation between Audre Lorde and James Baldwin, which, took, which was published in Essence magazine, very different audience, what they call an interfamilial conversation about feminism in the black community in the United States. Also incredibly direct, Audre Lorde and James Baldwin, two of the greatest minds of the 20th century in the United States, do not see eye to eye. They are of different generations. Audre Lorde takes James Baldwin to task, and he's not necessarily having it, and it's a fascinating conversation to read. Also, when you add in the layer that's not stated explicitly, but the fact that you're also talking about two queer African Americans in this context as well. I'm gonna muscle through this. Then we have a gallery devoted to art world, the art world and issues in the art world, times in which African American women felt completely excluded from the art world, and times in which the art world tried to address that with varying levels of success, including an exhibition that Anna Mendieta and others curated called Dialectics of Isolation, Issues of Heresies Magazine, and other examples of protests in front of the Whitney, in front of MoMA. Just above Midtown is a very important alternative space that arrived in 1984 uptown on 57th Street as a commercial gallery for black artists founded by Linda Good Bryant. It subsequently moves downtown and becomes an alternative space and it becomes the home for many, many of the artists in this exhibition and is a real focal point of this exhibition. Some more examples of work. Uh, Lorraine O'Grady's amazing debutante dress called Mademoiselle Bourgeoisie Noire that she made um, and wore in a gorilla um, performance at the New Museum in which she unannounced arrived in this dress that she made out of white gloves that she found at a secondhand store um, with a cat of nine tails announcing to the art world that they needed to wake up and take black artists seriously. Conversely, she also goes back to jam this gallery and does a performance where she also admonishes her community to also engage in the art world itself. So she puts herself in a position of taking multiple positions, which, um, as she said, she was afraid she was going to lose all her friends. Um, and I'll just say in the back, you can see a film here, an amazing video, amazing film by an extraordinary artist named Blondell Cummings. It's called Chicken Soup. It's an extraordinary video of a dance performance she did in which she engages in acts that she remembers from her mother and grandmother, um, cooking, cleaning, but it's this extraordinary dance piece in which she only has three props, and it's so beautiful. Okay. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Lorraine o um, Lorna Simpson, we move into the late 1980s. Lorna Simpson and Carrie Mae Weems are the youngest artists in the exhibition. And I'll just read because we wanted to include the Kambahi River Collective who were very instrumental in thinking about this exhibition and um, understanding its perspective. We um, wanted to close with a quote by them because they are not actually Artists, they were primarily writers, so we included them with their quote. We believe that the most profound and potentially the most radical politics come directly out of our own identity, as opposed to working to end someone else's oppression. In the case of black women, this is a particularly repugnant, dangerous, threatening, and therefore revolutionary concept, because it is obvious from looking at the political movement, at the political movements that have preceded us that anyone's more worthy of liberation than ourselves. We reject pedestals, queenhood, and walking 10 paces behind. To be recognized as human, levelly human, is enough. So this is an exhibition that 
really tries to decenter the idea of patriarchy, of whiteness, of the canon that most of us understand. And it is my hope that an exhibition like this changes the way that anybody else in the future does an exhibition by having to incorporate these artists and these voices. I'll just close by showing you this exhibition is going up in the Sackler Center right now, Roots of the Dinner Party, History in the Making, the first examination of Judy's practice in making the dinner party and pulling together an extraordinary group of people, an extraordinary amount of research, an extraordinary amount of work and brilliance to produce the dinner party. This is curated by Carmen Ermo, who is the assistant curator at the Sackler Center. And then after that, we will be presenting an exhibition that just opened in LA, um, Radical Women Latin American Art, almost the same period as war. We wanted a revolution is usually referred to as war. Um, covering a similar um, vein on a much larger scale um, of the revolutionary practices of largely conceptual Latin American women artists. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes. So now that we're redefining the feminist movement from the 70s, how are you taking into consideration people that are like non-binary and don't define themselves as either male or female? Are you taking that into consideration when you're talking about feminist art nowadays? I think we have to. <laughs> I think that the imperative conversation for feminism is to think about what it means to choose gender or not choose gender. I mean, if, if feminism grows from a sense of oppression that's based on um, a gender assignment, <laughs> so to speak, um, if one can, if one has the opportunity, as people do now, to think about what that means and makes decisions for themselves within the spectrum of what gender is understood to be, then I think feminism is kind of at the front lines of that conversation and needs to be. And that's absolutely one of the ways in which I think the Sackler Center, Elizabeth and I think the Sackler Center needs to exist in the future because um, how does feminism exist in a world in which people can choose to not have a gender? I, so I think what feminism has done to this point opens up a lot of um, theoretical frameworks for that discussion. I mean, I think the impact that feminist theorizing has had on both queer theorizing and disability theorizing, which I think are both two major places where a lot of this important work is being done, um, is really important. The source book, I should just mention, the source book that I talked about for the war exhibition is in your library, so I hope that if you have a chance, you might take a look at it. We will also be publishing a second volume. This is the first time the Brooklyn Museum has published two volumes um, for an exhibition. Within the next, hopefully, a <laughs> couple of months, we will have volume two out, which is contemporary writers responding to the exhibition, contemporary art historians. Um, the first one was called We Wanted a Revolution, a source book. Uh, the second one is called We Wanted a Revolution something. <laughs> New perspectives, I think. <laughs> And we spent a lot of time talking about that, so it's funny I should have that blank. Yeah, the, um, the first time I, I saw the, um, the dinner table, maybe three times, uh, the first time I was amazed um, by, the, by, by the artwork. Not so much, I mean, suddenly I, I found it by, by accident, and um, um, I was amazed by the um, creativity, let's say by the change, by the variation, by the materials, by you know everything in the work. I would like to discuss... By the ambition. By the ambition, <laughs> by, the, yeah, by the, the size, by everything. Um, the, something w which would be interesting, you would already address that question, is the, um, of course the, the question of form and content, the old question of form and content in a way that, uh, of course, she did some research in order to, to get the right ideas into the piece, 
but also the piece is so extraordinary because it is outstanding from and uh, revolutionary from uh, the point of view al also of uh, of its construction. Uh, can you quickly address this question of form and content? Sure, that actually brings to mind two things. One is um, the conversation that came up in this morning's session about the idea of essentialism versus a, a sort of broader discourse about theorizing of feminism um, is interesting to me. So to make it personal, I came of age in which the discourse about essentialism was highly critical. And it's been very interesting for me as a curator and an art historian to work with the dinner party for the past almost nine years. And one of the most remarkable things about living with it, if that's the right word, um, has been the way a younger generation of women in particular see the dinner party. It's an extraordinary l opportunity for a curator to live with a work of art and see it effectively become historicized. It is 40 years old at this point. It is a work of art that has lived through, as Elizabeth can tell you, <laughs> um, multiple um, forms of response, um, times methods of display, and sort of being off the radar for a little while. So it's a work of art that has an extraordinary history, but to see young women in particular come in and not necessarily even know anything about that history, but to respond to it as an object has been incredibly rewarding because what they see is an opportunity to explore history in a way that they still, in 2017, have not had that opportunity. So, um, and it's also extraordinary to me that when you walk around the dinner party, I've, I, I, I've often wondered, you know, why did Judy Chicago make a monumental sculpture instead of writing a book or an encyclopedia, you know? But when you experience the work of art, you have the experience of walking through history. You have the experience on the second side of the table of walking from early Christianity through the Reformation. <laughs> and you sort of actually physically experience that in a way that's quite extraordinary. So I think that Judy's brilliance is realizing the value, as Elizabeth said, of experiencing the piece um, as a work of art. And that's pretty amazing. The other thing I'll just throw in, this is off, off subject, um, the most amazing, and I said this on Friday, the most amazing thing to me, thinking about younger generations of people looking at things, the most amazing thing to me about the war exhibition has been the way that young women have responded to it on social media. Um, the way that young women on social media have driven a conversation about the value of artists and art from this period um, has been truly remarkable. And um, one of the most rewarding things I've experienced in my career is just following a hashtag and seeing young women telling each other that they need to go and see this exhibition and know these artists. So that's pretty amazing. That was not a question. Does anybody? <laughs> that was an editorial comment. Oh, we had two, right? You, you, okay. <laughs> started uh, talking about the um, methodological frame to talk about uh, art was uh, very interesting and uh, talking you said that uh, there are a section with ephemeral uh, we always have uh, ephemeral in our exhibition i think that there is really um maybe also another influence of feminist approach the attention to the the ephemerals all the things that are not the conclusion object, the things that remain, that enter into the market. So it's really part of your For methodological sure. frame. For sure. And I would go so far as to say that I believe that women have often made it into institutions through libraries. I'm not the first person to say this, but it is absolutely true. And we had an exhibition um, before the war exhibition. We had a remarkable exhibition on the artist Beverly Buchanan, uh, who was included in war. And that exhibition came from an artist, an amazing artist named Park MacArthur, who was doing re research in the Whitney Library and found a file on an artist named Beverly Buchanan and said, who is this person? I don't know anything about her. And that started Park on a path of discovering Beverly, which culminated in a book and in our exhibition. And now um, a very strong consensus, as far as I can see in the art world, that if you want to talk about land art in the future, you need to talk about Beverly Buchanan. And that's from a file in a library. So I think that that women have often found their way because they couldn't get into the museums, but they could get into a file in a library. 
And second, um, you said that Lucy Lippert, there is a lot of contact between Lippert and Lonsi. I know that talk. was, <laughs> although there isn't any connection, we don't know if Lonsi ever uh, knew we about ask her. Ah, uh, uh, she died. No, I can ask Lucy. Ah, we can ask Lucy, but I don't know if Lucy knows if, oh, but we can ask her. That, but in any case, uh, both of them, although uh, Lippert later, they both at a certain point Re, uh, retired from the art system. Also, Lucy Lieper, no? She, she she's moved. She's become much more engaged in environmental politics exactly. and land um, management usage and and work on. As if the market system was too much. And thinking about new way of talking about feminism, I think that maybe in this idea of a curator that has this uh, different method, Seth Siglab, although. Uh, yeah. wasn't a woman, was really part of this idea of a curator that had a different approach uh, with artists, with the, mm -hmm. the, the artwork and the way of uh, yep. showing yep. the art. Absolutely, and they were together in part of this period, so there, the conversations were there. The other interesting thing is, you know, Lucy, this is the best exhibition I ever curated, this is the best piece of... She was also accused when she did the numbers exhibition of being an artist, um, and she took it critically. And what's interesting to me is Linda Good Bryant, who's founded Just Above Midtown in 1984, was also accused of being an artist. In other words, using artists to sort of make their own art. Um, so the plays on all of those things within both of these dialogues is, I think, fascinating. Right. Uh, I almost don't want to say what I was going to say because I love this conversation, <laughs> uh, especially because, well, just briefly, I think, I think we're part. I think Siglau should be taken to task a lot more than he is for showing basically no women ever, except you know Adrian Piper being the secretary and uh, Christine Kozlov because of uh, we know who, et cetera. Um, but th the thing I wanted to say earlier, just as a young person who grew up in New York, I, rec I just finished my master's and I wrote a lot about Mary Laderman Kelly's. And there was this great piece by Helen Molesworth. It was actually Helen Molesworth's dissertation um, about Duchamp, but at the very end, she talks about Mary Leder Kelly, so she would write about a lot. And she makes this point about, you know, when I was studying art history, the narrative is Judy Chicago versus Mary Kelly, right. and that's the, what we exist in, which is just a reproduction of this very um, polar uh, discourse versus... Binary. Exactly. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> want to use that word again, but yeah, but exactly, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's applying a structuralist idea to something that shouldn't, it, it's not a structural discourse. So it's either Lacan or it's Judith Butler, let's say, or something like this. But I, so I read her piece where she says that if we insert Mary Leder Manu Kelly's, who is taking up domestic women's work, but essentially making it a Marxist call to arms, or at least that's how I would read it, if you insert that into this, then you can completely look at these works differently. And I went back to see the dinner, uh, the dinner party for probably the 10th time uh, after I finished, and I saw it in a completely different light, having that thought. So I think that's perhaps one way to break down this, uh, That's great. this binary. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for all the, I, I grew up in Brooklyn, so your work has been really awesome yeah. for me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Question? Sorry, not. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>